Let's now consider John Stuart Mill on Jeremy Bentham. The essay I have in mind is simply titled Bentham, though it's usually presented as part of a package sometimes called On Bentham and Coleridge, because there's also an essay written by Mill called simply Coleridge. This essay doesn't present any new economic ideas, but nonetheless it's quite important. It's Mill figuring out what are the limits of economics, and it's also explaining why, during the heyday of classical economics, the economists did not have more influence than they did. It's also a self-critical reflection on Mill's own life, as in his very early years he was very much a follower of Bentham, but over time his worldview switched in some ways closer to that of the poet Coleridge. And overall, you can think of the bundle of essays as in part showing off Mill's own ability to synthesize, namely that he understood the perspectives of the utilitarian economists, but also the poets. The essay Bentham was first published in 1838, and pictured here is Jeremy Bentham. Bentham really did put forward a new worldview in the England of the late 18th century, and this worldview consisted of classical economics, very consistently applied, utilitarianism, the notion of the greatest good for the greatest number, consistently applied, and an extreme rationalism, always trying to bring a systematic approach to bear on just about every social problem. For more on Bentham's economic ideas, you can see our videos on Bentham, but more generally you can think of him as a very great monomaniacal thinker who understood some things very well and other things not at all, but he was always one to consistently apply his principles, namely those of utilitarian rationalist reasoning. Mill understood Bentham's accomplishment quite clearly, and he wrote, and I quote, Bentham has been in this age and country the great questioner of things established. And this held whether it was the Anglican Church, whether it was the tariffs, whether it was the treatment of women, the treatment of animals, or even gay rights. Bentham and all of these issues spoke up very clearly as an advocate for principles which would increase the happiness of human beings, or if need be, animals too. What Mill really sees as striking in Bentham was Bentham's method. Again, this idea of consistently applying this very small number of principles. At the most general level, Mill took Bentham's method to be not just utilitarianism or rationalism, but indeed what we would today call reductionism, that is to take any problem and break it down into very clear small pieces and proceed to look at the problem by analyzing those small pieces. But Mill sees this methodological enterprise as ultimately somewhat solipsistic, and Mill criticizes, and I quote, his, Bentham's, determination to create a philosophy wholly out of the materials furnished by his own mind and by minds like his own. And Mill criticizes, quote, the incompleteness of his own mind as a representative of universal human nature. Mill also criticized Bentham's, quote, slender stock of premises. So what exactly was it that Bentham was neglecting? Well, for Mill it was a number of things, including the religious motive for human behavior, the notion of sympathy, the idea of self-respect, and other features of human behavior, including love of honor, order, and power, and in general simply the phenomenon of loving. It's not that these ideas are totally absent in Bentham by any means, but rather they are always subordinate to some fairly narrow notion of rational self-interest, and Mill was trying to claim an autonomy for these motives, and to claim that once you see these motives as autonomous, that Bentham's premises are slender indeed, and that this blend of classical economics, utilitarianism, and rationalism, well, ultimately it was missing a big part of the total picture. Mill also thought that Bentham missed out on the importance of national culture in making explanations, and that often national culture would explain things better than rational self-interest. And most of all, Mill believed that Bentham missed out on some fundamental understanding of the poetic imagination, and ultimately this will tie into Mill's interest in Coleridge and the British Romantics. On Bentham, here's a good quotation from Mill, quote, the business part is accordingly the only province of human affairs which Bentham has cultivated with any success, into which he has introduced any considerable number of comprehensive and luminous practical principles. That is the field of his greatness, and there he is indeed great. 
He has swept away the accumulated cobwebs of centuries. And yet there is a catch. Quoting Mill, it will do nothing for the spiritual interests of society.